A very good afternoon to you all, Distin distinguished guests. I'm delighted and honored to be chairing this very special session with His Excellency Prime Minister Barzani. Let me firstly congratulate the American University of Kurdistan for what has so far been a wonderful conference uh, and really a space in which we have all engaged in frank, direct, rich, and dynamic discussions. The theme of this conference, regional peace and security, tends to normally focus on great power rivalries, interstate relations, the questions of violence, political instability. It's a complicated Middle East, to say the least, a very fragmented region, but to make things even worse, it's also become a fragmented international order. And this really is an opportunity for us to listen to the Prime Minister, to hear his thoughts on his vision, not only for Kurdistan, not only for Iraq, but most certainly for the region and the international community. Prime Minister, I want to express my gratitude on behalf of all of us for your time uh, and really the opportunity for us to listen to you today. Let me start off by discussing some of the themes we've discussed at this conference. Personally, I feel questions of geopolitics, questions of foreign policy, tend to disproportionately focus on things like reconstruction, on things like the threat of terrorism. Now, these are most certainly important elements of any <coughs> successful peace-building strategy. But before we discuss all that, I want to bring the attention to the humanitarian effort that is, in my opinion, fundamental and not stated enough. Because this, of course, is something that addresses the immediate needs of local communities and populations. This is something that truly affects people on a daily basis. And I know that you personally have been involved with finding solutions, addressing humanitarian crises, both near and afar. And I followed your work recently uh, and your visits to the Syrian refugee camps. <coughs> so I wanted to really ask you how you would, for example, advise the international community and what your hopes are for this humanitarian effort. The floor is yours, Prime Minister. Oh, thank you, Dr. Rand. Uh, please allow me to first thank the American University of Kurdistan for arranging this forum. Uh, it's a very important time for our country and for the region to address peace and security. Uh, and I'd like to welcome all these distinguished guests all the uh, experts and scholars that have come from far away to attend this forum. And I thank you uh, for inviting me. Now back to your question. Uh, of course, humanitarian uh, crises usually happens when there are other problems. One of the biggest problems that we faced in this region was security. The rise of terrorism and ethnic cleansing uh, political differences, economic collapse, all led to the flow of refugees and the displacement of people from one area to another. Now we see that many of these people are coming to Kurdistan. That by itself says a lot, that Kurdistan is a much safer place. It respects people and it is protecting these people who are fleeing from the threat of terror, and in many cases, uh, of course, also because of the uh, way that they are living. Uh, so currently, we are hosting about 1.5 million IDPs and refugees. And most recently, we have seen a flow of refugees from Syria. So far, I believe somewhere around 16,000 people have crossed the border and are settled in, in the camps in the KRG. I visited some of these camps. Most recently, I was in one. And I've seen the devastation and the suffering of these people. Uh, but in order to take care of this issue in general, we have to look at how we can address the problem from its roots. 
why are people fleeing? Why are people leaving? And I believe in, in, in a general uh, term, when we look, we, we see that the entire region is in turmoil. And uh, many of those people who are fleeing and coming here are coming because they don't feel safe and secure and they don't feel that they have enough to even feed themselves or a shelter to live in. Uh, this is a huge responsibility for the KRG, but also a huge burden. We have been taking care of these people for many years. And we were hoping that the uh, federal government of Iraq and the international community would come to the assistance of the KRG to help. But unfortunately, the level of assistance that we've seen so far is not to the extent that can really elevate the burden on the KRG itself. So we are, uh, I can say that uh, most, of, uh, most of the burden has been on the KRG. It has cost the KRG about $1.5 billion annually. And this will continue unless there are solutions and ways to help these people return to their original homes. But how can they go home? They will not go home if there is no security. They will not go home if they don't have a safe place to live in. They don't go home if they don't have access to the basic services. No schools, no hospitals, no jobs, no salaries. Of course, many of the people that have been living in camps in Kurdistan after the defeat of uh, partial defeat, I must say, of ISIS in some areas, they wanted to return. But then when they went back, because they could not really uh, have the services that they deserve, many of them once again came back to Kurdistan. Uh, we are calling on the international community to help us, to first help us take care of the refugees that are in Kurdistan, but also to help us uh, help them to return to where they came from. And that will not happen if they are not uh, engaged in uh, reconstructing the region, providing adequate secu security for those people, and of course providing the services that people need. This is the responsibility of the federal government of Iraq for all those IDPs that have come from different parts of the country, and it's an international responsibility, international responsibility for those refugees that have come from other countries into Kurdistan region. I hope that uh, they uh, see that as a, uh, let's say, a moral and uh, uh, important responsibility that, that falls on their shoulder to come to our assistance in this. Thank you. Thanks very much, Prime Minister. And I guess that was a great way of setting the scene for the multiple interactions that have to be appreciated if one is indeed to come up with an effective response to these problems. It's, it's perhaps a reflection of where things stand and indeed a positive thing. But I do get the sense that we might be going back to being complacent when it comes to the revival of organizations like ISIS. So there's plenty of talk in major international capitals that ISIS has been defeated. It's a narrative that has taken hold in the media and indeed policy circles. Can I ask you whether you're optimistic about continuing to suppress extremist terrorist organizations like ISIS? Is it still a threat that can revive itself? Uh, and in Kurdistan, of course, it's a region that knew the likes of ISIS long before it hit the international stage in 2014. Uh, I don't think that ISIS is defeated because I might have a different definition to ISIS. ISIS to us is not just a caliphate or a number of people who are uh, carrying guns and threatening people. It's an ideology. ISIS lost territory. The international community was successful in liberating areas from ISIS. Uh, but ISIS as an ideology is not defeated. Even as members, there are still thousands of sympathizers and active members of ISIS uh, in Iraq, in Syria, and in the region. Uh, to defeat ISIS, military operations are not enough you have to once again look at the root causes that led to the rise of terrorism and extremism. Uh, 
in Iraq, for instance, and also, I mean, that's true for Syria, the, when there is a lack of security, that's when terrorism uh, flourishes. And there are a number of factors that lead to the rise of extremism. Uh, failure of political consensus or some sort of agreement on the government, uh, economic collapse, poverty, inequality, injustice, all of these are reasons and factors that pushes people to collaborate with extremism or become active, mem active members of extremist organizations and terrorist organizations such as ISIS. So in order to eradicate terrorism, you have to address these issues. There has to be a political understanding and political agreement amongst the players uh, to provide an environment where people are confident and believe in their rights and feel that they are equally represented in the government. There has to be a prosper economy where jobs are created, people are getting their salaries and basic services are provided for people. There has to be security. Without security, you can't have these things. So when you look at it, it's almost like a circle to me. It's a cycle that one feeds to the other. If you have good security, then investors would feel comfortable to come and invest, and that would lead to a better economy. A good economy leads to political stability. If one of them doesn't exist, then, of course, the chain is broken. And it would be very hard and difficult to think about eradicating terrorism because the root causes are there. These root causes are still not been addressed adequately as we are looking at the situation in Iraq and in Syria. So I don't think ISIS is defeated. I, uh, and we see the threat of ISIS is uh, very much alive and serious, not only to this region, but to the, to the world. That requires a much closer cooperation uh, uh, by all the actors, international actors, to come together and look at how they can eradicate terrorism and how to win peace, not just the war. And that takes much more than military operations. Thank you, Prime Minister. I think on the political consensus point you made, it immediately triggered the events in Baghdad in my mind because for many, before the situation unfolded as it has in the South, many uh, thought of Kurdistan t turning a new chapter uh, since your government was formed, since you became prime minister. But yet, here you are finding yourself in a position where you have to deal with yet another crisis which could have, and perhaps already is having direct implications for your government, for governance in Kurdistan. And Indeed, we've heard from a number of speakers already uh, what the protests could mean for Iraq at large. I was hoping perhaps we could hear from you on your thoughts on uh, the immediate consequences of the protests in Baghdad, but perhaps also the long-term implications. First of all, I think uh, protesters have the right to be frustrated, to raise their concerns, and to ask for a better life. And we do support the legitimate and peaceful demands of this people. They deserve a better life. They deserve a better way of uh, governance. Uh, they deserve equal opportunities. They deserve all the services that uh, a normal citizen should have. And when you don't have these things, then of course people at some point are going to pour to the streets and they will demonstrate. This is what's happening. Now, there is a difference uh, between what people want and what political agendas of political parties are mixed with the demands of the protesters. Uh, political parties represent their constituencies. And no one, no political party can speak on behalf of the entire nation or all of the people. So there are all different segments of the population that are dissatisfied and all are talking about the uh, current uh, uh, situation. I must say that they all agree that something is wrong. 
there, there is a united view that something is wrong, but they all disagree on what the solution should be. They don't have one simple solution, so they have many solutions according to themselves and according to the agendas that they represent or the hope of the future for the country. So, like I said, you know, they all agree on one thing, but they don't have a common solution for what might be uh, the alternative to the current, uh, uh, let's say, crisis in, in Iraq or, or, the, or the current government. So, you know, we do support the people. Uh, we feel for them, we sympathize with them, and we hope that uh, the government is responsible enough to listen to them and to act uh, very quickly to address uh, their concerns. Uh, it's not enough to only talk about it. There has to be some immediate actions to satisfy the needs of these people. But we also have to be very careful about the alternative and what some agendas are, how they are mixed with, uh, with uh, the, the protesters' uh, demands. Now, in terms of the government, uh, we've said it before that we don't hold the current government, and especially the current prime minister, as the only one or the only man or the only administration responsible for what's happened in Iraq. We have seen these problems over the last 15, 16 years. So we are seeing an accumulation of all these problems that have added over the years. And now, unfortunately, uh, people are talking about it today, and the current government is being held responsible. I don't think it's uh, fair to only hold them responsible, uh, but that doesn't mean that nothing should happen. Of course, uh, the government has to be given a fair opportunity uh, if they did not, and they have to get the support that any government would need to uh, make the reforms that are uh, necessary for people. Uh, that opportunity, once given, there has to be a time frame of uh, uh, making the right corrections or the right judgments at, 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 uh, within that framework. And then I hope, I hope that the situation can improve. Uh, so basically that's, that's where we are. Right. And, and, and it's certainly something which, of course, Iraq does not operate in a void. What happens in neighboring countries has direct consequences for the country at large. Do you feel that this is a crisis which depends on, not only needs outside intervention, but depends on outside intervention? Or is it something that ultimately has to be dealt with amongst the different factions and communities themselves? Like I said, you know, uh, unfortunately, I mean, this is a very broad uh, issue and uh, it may not be easy to answer it uh, from only one perspective. If you look at the history, the recent history of Iraq, let's say after 2003, uh, I believe that the Iraqis never had the chance to make their own decisions. There has always been external players and actors that imposed uh, their agendas and trying to find solutions for the Iraqi people. Uh, we tried in 2005 to write the constitution that we thought would satisfy all the components of the country. Of course, none of us were 100% happy with it, but that itself is a good indication that this constitution was a good one. Because, you know, if someone is fully happy, then it must have been on the expense of the other side. Uh, so it was a package of compromises. We all believe that uh, there needs to be a you know, new chapter for the country. The Constitution was written, agreed, and ratified by a great majority of the Iraqi people. But what happened after that? Instead of implementing the Constitution, uh, many of the uh, articles of the Constitution were abandoned, ignored, and the governments of, the, of Iraq different administrations were uh, selecting, very selective in implementing the articles of the Constitution, mainly supporting those articles that helped the centralization of the government rather than decentralization of the government. 
that was one of the biggest problems. So what we see today has a very long background. It has a history that uh, allowed others to interfere. When you don't have a, uh, let's say, good government in place, an inclusive government, a representative government that can respond to the needs of all of its people, then there is opportunity for external actors to play in. And that's exactly what happened. Iraq is an important country. It's geopolitical uh, situation, it's uh, wealth, uh, it's history. Uh, it's a, it makes it a very strategic place for not only the regional countries, but for the international countries. So when Iraq doesn't have a policy of its own, then other people try to inject their agendas to make that policy as if this is an Iraqi policy. And I think all of these uh, started to create a, um, a bigger, uh, let's say, complicated uh, problem for, for the country. And uh, uh, unless, uh, unless there is a uh, common ground for all the components of Iraq that can trust each other, can believe in each other, and can believe in a future, that they should feel guarantee, you know, that, that they should have the guarantee that their future is secure enough these problems will, will not fade away. They will still continue and at one point or another they will come back in a different form and shape. So I believe there is a fundamental issue in question. It's not about whether or not people are having uh, difficulties with uh, one government or one administration. The entire system uh, unfortunately is not uh, fully committed to the uh, implementation of the Constitution and the respect of the needs of all of its components uh, in this country. And, and, and do you think, Prime Minister, that you know, we've, we've seen, looking at events in Washington with the current administration, that there is certainly a disengagement from reconstruction and stabilization. Some might argue this administration has lost all interest, in fact, in the Middle East. Uh, and one does think given the region's dependency on the American presence to maintain some balance, some sort of an equilibrium, whether that represents an opportunity for the region to find that consensus you refer to, that common agenda and framework, or whether in fact this could spell problems down the line. Now, the United States has its own policy. Now, some people uh, earlier this morning, all the panelists were talking about whether or not the United States or other countries have policies or not. I mean, I can't speak on behalf of the United States. But one thing I can say, that U.S. Uh, United States was involved in toppling Saddam's regime, and we all appreciate that. We all were, were very thankful for assisting uh, the people of Iraq uh, and in, in liberating the country from a dictatorial uh, regime. Uh, I said liberation, but I heard invasion. And, uh, uh, I think that was a mistake from the very beginning, that the United States changed its status from liberators to occupiers, to invaders. Nobody likes invasion, but everybody loves liberators. Iraq was liberated, but I, I don't think that the United States could invest in this, could really take advantage of the situation that they created. Many people uh, were very supportive of the role of the United States at the beginning. But then there was another problem. U.S. must understand, U.S. and every other country who have interests and good relations with Iraq, they must accept that Iraq is a different country. You cannot simply uh, duplicate policies and think about what is best for another country that has a different culture, that lives in a different region, that has other interests. So you have to really be supportive. You know, the, the US or other uh, friends of Iraq must come and help Iraq and not impose agendas on them. I think at the beginning, uh, the genuine uh, let's say, opposition that fought alongside the United States that liberated the country and then eventually uh, turned in, you know, uh, the page and started a fresh start. Uh, 
the, the, their ideas were not taken into account. Uh, the way that the Iraqis wanted to live uh, were, to, to a large extent, ignored. And there was this, this, was this uh, uh, let's say, uh, imposition of, of ideas or, or dictating these ideas one way or another on them, which, which were not successful. And I still think that for the U.S. or for any other country that uh, is interested in uh, playing a positive and constructive role in Iraq, they must be brave enough to address the real problems in the country. Iraq has some serious issues. It's not about an article on the Constitution. It's about the very uh, nature of the country, the, the very foundation of the country on which this country was built on. Uh, something was wrong with it then, and something is wrong with it today. There is a great need for a, uh, a brave, uh, let's say, uh, you know, admission or confession that these, these problems must be put on the table. Why, why this country is not really functioning well? Some people are not comfortable. Some components of the country, one, at one point of time, are not comfortable. I heard earlier the panelists were talking about, uh, you know, earlier that the Sunnis were in charge, and now Shias are in charge. And where, when are Iraqis are in charge? You know, I mean, when, when, when you identify people, you identify them by their sects and by their ethn ethnicities. And this is the reality of the country. You know, Iraq is consisted of Shia Arabs, Sunni Arabs, Kurds, Turkmans, Christians. So there are many different components that none of them really still can feel that they are full Iraqis. They are first, they, they belong to the religious, an ethnic group before they belong to the country. With that, there is always that defensive uh, attitude that uh, if, if you belong to one particular ethnic group, you always are defensive and you always are afraid that if the other ethnicity of the other religion, uh, religious group takes control of the power or the government, then something is going to uh, go very bad for you and it will be very wrong. That, these, are, these are serious issues. I mean, we, we, we don't want to just, you know, superficially look at these things. These are some really deep problems that scholars and uh, policymakers have to be ready to address these issues um, and, and accept it. Once you accept that there is such a problem, once you diagnose the problem, then it's easy to find solutions for. But I think the main problem in this country Nobody wants to admit what the real problems are. And everybody are just looking at the symptoms and not at the root causes that uh, uh, are the real problems with this country. Thank you, Prime Minister. That's very helpful. I mean, it's almost a paradox, I guess, because you're referring to the identities that shape this country and its landscape. But yet, in Kurdistan, you have friends and enemies converging on a regular basis. And sticking with the theme of whether this country can be a uh, bridge builder or whether it will be a conflict zone, uh, I'd like to tie that into comments that were made in the previous panel, mm -hmm. where I believe it was Ken Pollock and Muhammad Shabani who spoke of American values in foreign policy and Iranian values in their foreign policy, although they didn't actually clarify what those values were. Um, so I'd like to ask you, Kurdistan's foreign policy, what values would you say shape Kurdistan's foreign policy? We are proud to say that uh, Kurdistan is a land of tolerance and coexistence. Uh, we are not just saying that, we have proven that. Uh, we talked earlier that so many IDPs and refugees of different backgrounds are seeking refuge in Kurdistan. There must be a reason for it, and this is it. We respect human rights. We respect all religions. We uh, uh, believe in coexistence. We believe in dialogue for solving problems. Uh, we have always rejected violence. We have never, ever 
uh, been on the offense against any of, uh, let's say, the regional countries or even when we had problems with the federal government. We've always been taking a very defensive policy to protect ourselves. And we think that this can happen by creating a strong unity uh, from within. Uh, of course, respecting all the uh, people of different backgrounds, different ethnic and religious groups that live in Kurdistan. This is, I think, a trademark for Kurdistan, and I, I believe that the rest of the world realizes this. They know that Kurdistan is a land of peace and tolerance. So we hope that uh, the neighboring countries, the federal government, the international co countries uh, respect the, uh, uh, the, these values that I believe Kurdistan is known for. And are you hopeful, Prime Minister, that the so-called or actual U.S. disengagement uh, doesn't result in great power competi competition that destabilizes the country further, not just in Iraq, but also the region, of course? You know, when, when you're saying U.S. disengagement, I mean, we have to talk about the periods of time because U.S. was engaged. It is still engaged. It's just about uh, how much disengagement and at what time. Because this situation would not be the same if U.S. has not, if, if they had not engaged. So U.S. has its fingerprints on what's happening in this region. The immediate withdrawal of the U.S. in this area will create a vacuum. It has created a vacuum, and that vacuum was not filled by the Iraqi people, but by Iraqi's neighbors. Uh, so when we are talking about the disengagement, we must understand what the U.S. wants from this region. Do they want to stay engaged in the Middle East, or are they just giving it up? If that's happening, then it would take a, it would take a period of time to uh, recover from the influences that uh, they've had in this region for so many years. But I don't think that uh, people are talking about the U.S. disengagement. It's, it's again, I mean, it's, it, it's the U.S. policy that must define that. We don't know, honestly, we don't know what exactly the U.S. policy is for this area. Uh, you know, we are, we are talking to the diplomats, we are talking to the government officials, and they are telling us that, uh, you know, they want uh, peace, stability, but Peace and stability don't come on its own. It needs help, especially in a uh, country, uh, devastated country such as Iraq. Friends of Iraq, including the United States, must still heavily engage in building that peace and stability. So we disagree that uh, uh, this engagement is, uh, is helping the US policies in the region, especially if they are thinking of a long-term uh, interest in, in the Middle East. And do you think, Prime Minister, that it's critical for America to start viewing actors like Kurdistan and others as partners, as allies slash partners? Yes, definitely. We always believe and consider ourselves as allies of the United States and the Western countries. Uh, we just hope that they see us the same way. Uh, so we, uh, we have been a part of this coalition against terrorism for many years. We have proven that we are credible and reliable friends and allies. Now we want Kurdistan to fall into the framework of the Western allies and, and uh, interests. So I, uh, I definitely support uh, what you said that, uh, you know, the, uh, but again, I mean, it depends on whether or not the U.S. and the Western countries are still looking at us as allies. I, we, we share the same values in terms of respecting you know, religious and, and uh, human, uh, human rights, uh, women rights in, uh, in, in this region, uh, freedom, democracy. I mean, these are, these are things that we share with the Western countries. So I, saw, I, I see no reason why they cannot fit Kurdistan region uh, into their uh, number of uh, allied friends in, in, this, in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Let, let me bring the discussion close to home. Uh, mm -hmm. I know your government, under your leadership, is wholly committed to the reform process, to good governance, and we've had an excellent range of discussions already over the past two years on the nexus between good governance 
and stability, yeah. national stability, regional stability. Can I get your thoughts on your ambitions, your hopes? Yes, of course. I mean, good government, good governance is the key. You know, when you had a good government, then people are happy and people are represented and uh, uh, there is uh, some sort of interaction between people and, and the government. Uh, when I took this office and uh, in this new cabinet, I've made it very clear that the government should serve the people, not the other way around. We are not here to impose ideas on people, we are here to serve people. And this is, this is the core uh, message and, and the agenda of this new cabinet. That requires a lot of work. Of course, we have to do reforms, and we have started these reforms. Uh, administrative reforms, financial reforms, fighting corruption. Uh, by the way, we have managed to uh, reduce corruption uh, to a great, you know, a great deal. So that there's already been some, some progress. So we are seeing the, the improvement in the performance of the government and the relationship between people and, and the government. I, uh, I, I do believe that uh, a good governance is the key because uh, people must, uh, first of all, trust and have confidence in their government. They need to feel respected by the representatives in the government they need to feel that the government is there to protect and serve them. Thank you. I think the, the, the range of spoilers uh, is rather wide in this part of the world. And so your best efforts to achieve stability, to achieve good governance can be appended, can be undermined within a day in fact. And we've already spoken of the threat that ISIS presents in that regard and other terrorist organizations but it's also still a very volatile region, whether it's in events in Syria, in Iran, and of course there's the international dimension, the increase in tensions between the US and Iran. Iraq has already hosted proxy conflict on its territory over the past 10 years. Are you confident that Washington and Tehran can reach a deal of sorts? I mean, what are the concerns, let's say, within your cabinet in, in that regard? You know, simple answer, I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, these, are, these are some uh, much bigger issues, uh, bigger than the Kurdistan region. Of course, we are already, always ready to play a constructive role, as we have played in the past. Uh, but we must understand uh, how much influence we have we also must understand the size of influence and the size of our own region and capabilities that we have. A good friend of mine once told me that when two elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. We don't want to be that grass. I know that there are serious issues, but certainly our view is very clear. We support stability. We don't want uh, more uh, conflicts in this region. Uh, we believe that uh, all the differences should be solved by dialogue and peaceful means. And I believe everybody benefits from it, including us. So if we can play a role in promoting peace and stability, we are ready to do that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got a whole host of questions I could ask the Prime Minister. So I could be here all day. Let me open up the floor to you for your questions, uh, if I may. Uh, and this will be a struggle as I try to <laughs> indiscriminately select the speakers. Let's start with you, Ambassador Blakua. Uh, thank you. And, and can you please uh, identify yourself and your organization, please? Okay, um, I'm Ramon Blakua. I'm the, with the, minister, the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, current EU Ambassador to Iraq. Uh, Prime Minister, you made a very frank uh, assessment and diagnosis of the problems and, and some of your solutions or your proposals uh, for the Kurdistan region. I would like to ask you about the future vision. Of course, we are on the brink of tremendous political crisis, some say even the brink of a regional war. Um, but when you look at the future, at the challenges, 
what is what is your vision? What is your long-term vision? I mean, obviously, that the risk of climate change, the scarcity of resources, and Czech population growth, failure of the state, all that, or there's the possibility of regional integration based on shared interest, on the, the possibility of opening up to more economic development, new new ideas, new uh, new proposals. What do you see yes. when you look at that? Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we have uh, expressed uh, the, uh, presented our agenda about what our vision is for the next four years. Uh, we believe that there are, you know, there are two different ways of looking at it. Some are internal, what we can do, and some of it is really outside of our control, and that's the, the regional developments and how we can play a role, a constructive role in the regional developments. But let me focus on our own issues that we should do and we can do. We've already uh, said that we want to build a stronger Kurdistan. A stronger Kurdistan means better security, better economy, uh, better political, let's say, uh, understanding or stability in the region. Uh, we definitely are looking at uh, repairing relations with Baghdad. We are looking at opening up to the world to have better diplomatic relations with the rest of the world. We are looking at diversifying our economy so that we will not only be dependent on the oil cell, and for that we are heavily focusing on uh, developing the uh, uh, agriculture, industry, tourism, uh, looking at uh, uh, health and education. So these are some of the uh, plans that we have and we, have al we are already implementing. We are in the phase of implementation. Uh, we are also looking at how we can uh, have a better security for the region, and that is to uh, be ready and to continue staying engaged with the international com community in, in combating terrorism. We will combat terrorism uh, whether we have allies or not, because this is something that we truly believe that extremism and fundamentalism and, uh, uh, let's say, terrorism uh, do not have a place in our society. They shouldn't have a place in our society. Uh, we are looking at how we can provide better services to our people, and that is by the reforms that I've already talked about. We are trying to look at how we can digitalize the services for the people and how we can, uh, let's say, cut the bureaucracies of, uh, and, and, and help our citizens be more comfortable. We are looking at how we can attract foreign investors to come into Kurdistan and how we can facilitate and, and help those foreign investors to come in. At the same time, how to help our own local investors to look at internal investment and rather than looking at investing outside of Kurdistan. So when you have a strong economy, it means you have more jobs, it means you have more salaries, it means that you have a better way of living, and that leads to political stability. It, it brings me back to the circle that I was talking about earlier. With a strong economy, with a, uh, let's say, uh, uh, stable political environment, you have, a you have a much better security. And when you have all of that, you have a much stronger community, you have a much stronger region. And this is what, this is what we are trying to achieve. And we have already started this. We are looking inward and then also trying to be uh, as positive as we possibly can with the players that are around us. Okay, we have two very determined members of the audience there. You, sir, yeah? Gentleman at the front. Right there, sorry, no, two rows in front. Uh, can you stand up? Yeah, yeah, the gentleman who stood up there. Bl blue tie, blue jacket, yeah, that's it. No, the other blue jacket. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much, Galip Talay from Al Shakram and University of Oxford. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, in your speech, you emphasized the necessity of U.S. engagement with the region. But right now, the perception or the reality—I uh, don't know which one is the truth—that the U.S. is at least partially disengaged with the region, and that has created among the U.S. allies in the region to go for hedging options when it comes to their international alliance structure. Many people start to knocking on the door of the uh, Moscow. Many people start to knocking on the door of the Beijing. 
Is Kurdistan also engaging in any hedging options, bearing in mind that the U.S. might not be as committed to Kurdistan as it was before? And secondly, how is the relation of the Kurdistan with uh, Russia overall? And how do you perceive the role of the Russia in the region uh, in general? Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, when I say that I think the U.S. should stay engaged, it doesn't mean that the U.S. will listen to me. This is, this is what I think. But then what they do, uh, obviously, is their decision. But I, I think that the in involvement, the engagement of the U.S. here is good for the people of this region. Now, uh, are we looking at other options? Uh, we, we have no animosity with anyone. None of the regional countries we have any animosity with or the international uh, players. We have good relations. We are extending our hand of friendship to everyone. Whoever wants to take our hand, we will shake their hands. So we have uh, no interest in escalating tensions or problems with regional or international players. With Russia, again, I mean, we have good relations with Russia too. They are involved in uh, some projects uh, in the region, in the country as a whole. And uh, we welcome the uh, constructive and positive involvement of all of the friends of Kurdistan and Iraq. Let's go to the middle for now. Uh, you, sir, right at the back, the gentleman with the spectacles. And I hope you're the only person with spectacles. Let's get you are. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Ranj. Um, and thank you also, Prime Minister. For, and, sorry, uh, for, can you identify yourself and your uh, yes, organization? Uh, um, James Moran, I'm from the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. Um, thank you also, Prime Minister, for, I thought, a very articulate uh, rendition you gave us about uh, the reforms that are going on. Um, quick question here. Um, issue which affects your uh, uh, region and also the region as a whole, which of course is corruption. It's front and center. It's at the root of um, a number of um, civil disturbances in recent months. You said that you had had some successes, and I wondered whether you might want to elaborate a little bit on those successes, and whether or not you think they might have some lessons for the rest of the region. Thank you. I think a responsible government uh, is able to minimize uh, corruption. Uh, it would probably be very difficult, and maybe not the right way of saying eliminating corruption, because it's impossible. Uh, it's, uh, it's about how much of corruption you can really reduce and minimize. We have done that by creating a very strong and, and responsive and responsible government. First of all, you know, we don't look at corruption only as financial corruption. Like, you know, I've, I've said this before in, in a different panel, but uh, time, for instance, you know, when you have government employees, that people depend on to run their affairs. When they only work two hours a day, but they are getting paid for the full day, that's corruption. So you need to force those people to come and be responsible and do their job and serve full term. That's one thing that we have done it very early on when we started this cabinet. Second, bribing or any sort of, uh, uh, you know, expediting the affairs based on relationships. We have stopped that completely. And if we see anything like that happening, we will immediately, we have taken actions and we will take actions. So providing equal opportunities to everyone is the key to make people feel comfortable that they are full citizens and they have equal opportunities. Provide, you know, <clears throat> providing justice. These are, these are the things that you can do to fight corruption. Corruption is not just you know, identifying one person and then taking actions against them. You have to prevent, you have to prevent people uh, you know, doing uh, corrupt things. Now, that could be uh, people from the government or it could be uh, individuals in the you know, business sector or whoever they may be. So fighting, you know, fighting corruption, uh, what we have done, we have stopped it. We have stopped corruption. No one can rely anymore 
on the support of a friend or a friend of a friend to do their job in the government. They all have equal opportunities. And then, of course, we have programs to look at how we can fix some of the wrongdoings that happened in the past. And this is a process, but we need a legal process to do this. And we are already engaged in uh, following that up too. Thank you, Prime Minister. Let's get a, a Kurdish voice. Uh, you, sir, the back. <coughs> and please identify yourself. Uh, thank you, Karkaranj. My name is Heyman Mirhan, University of Kurdistan. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, a lack of good governance and social justice has led to a huge trust deficit between Iraqis and establishment. There are some reports that uh, the demonstration demonstrators demand for more of the effective rather than a legitimate government. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, what would be your standing if the demonstration has somewhat compelled Iraqi politicians to go for a more of a vertical style of leadership, a presidential or a central centralized kind of system in Iraq? What would be the KRG's position on that? Thank you very much. I think when you have a legitimate and representative government, if uh, people are elected freely and fairly, uh, I don't think that they would be irresponsible or that they would promote corruption. Uh, so legitimacy uh, and effect, you know, being effective uh, go hand in hand. I think there is something wrong with the way that the government was set up because of the way that you know, uh, because of all the problems in the past, I don't want to go into the details. But I, I would never accept and agree to a dictatorial system. I don't think that the dictatorial system is good for the people. I mean, it may be very firm on stopping people from doing the wrong things, but then it will take away their freedom, uh, like we've seen in the past. The best way of governance, still, I believe, is a, uh, a democratic way of government. So that's, that, that's my belief. And you, sir, you've been waiting very patiently. The gentleman there with the pink tie. William Morris, Next Century Foundation. Prime Minister, uh, we live in a turbulent, you live in a turbulent region. And uh, we've seen the, you, you said when two elephants fight, the grass gets damaged. When two elephants get friendly, and I'm talking about the United States and Turkey, the grass also gets damaged. We've seen it in northern Syria. Um, and Turkey has been a little bit troubling of late. Uh, it's quite expansionist. You've got, to, nobody can visit Bashika anymore because they've got a military base in Bashika. Yesterday they were bombing Sinjar, poor Sinjar. Turkey bombing Sinjar now, um, because it has PKK there. Uh, but, you know, Turkish expansionism is, is, is dangerous. America and Turkey are close to one another. America has proved itself an unreliable ally. Indeed, it's betrayed the Turks in, uh, sorry, betrayed the Kurds in uh, northern Syria, as we all know. So it's a dangerous time. And, and meanwhile, your other friends or erstwhile friends or sometime friends, the Iranians, are perceived as shooting demonstrators, whether they have been or not. So um, you're in a region where you can no longer depend on any of the big players. Um, do you need now to develop a much stronger relationship with Baghdad for the sake of Kurdistan? We've never been against a strong relations with Baghdad. It was always Baghdad that rejected that strong relationship and ties with Kurdistan. When we ratified the constitution, we wanted to be a very active uh, member of uh, the, the government. Uh, so that, 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 that wasn't our choice. And whenever Baghdad is ready, whenever Baghdad is ready to uh, have those strong ties with KRG, we are always ready to do it. And now there is an opportunity. We are already uh, going and uh, uh, you know, trying to repair relations with Baghdad and to, to start that, uh, that strong relationship with Baghdad. When it comes to the regional countries, like I said, you know, we, don't, uh, we don't have any interest in escalating tension with any of the neighboring countries. We respect their uh, 
country. We respect uh, uh, their concerns. Some of them have, do have security concerns, uh, which is understandable. But that doesn't mean that uh, their problem should be exported to Iraq or to Kurdistan. Uh, Kurdistan is a place that we need stability. We want peace. We want prosperity. We want to be friends with all. And we don't want to any we don't want any country to export their problems to our region. And that that is a two way street. Those people who don't want Turkish intervention or Turkish bombardment should not give Turkey any excuse to come and bomb these regions. You were talking about Sinjar. Why are those people in Sinjar? At the end, I mean it's people of Sinjar that are paying the price because there are some external elements in Sinjar that uh, shouldn't be there. Of course, I mean, that gives excuses to Turkey. I mean, would Turkey uh, bomb Sinjar if there were no concerns, now legitimate, legitimate or not, true or not? I mean, that, put that aside. But I'm talking about an excuse. Would there be any excuse if those elements were not there? So what I'm saying is that everybody has to be very responsible. I mean, we, we are against the intervention invasion, incursion of any country into some other's country. That is our formal position. But at the same time, we are also not supportive of these uh, elements that are dragging problems into our region. I hope that all sides respect what we want. And what we want is good relations with the neighbors and peace and prosperity and stability for the region. Thank you, Prime Minister. We have unfortunately run out of time, and I do apologize to those of you who couldn't ask questions, uh, but this has been a rich, dynamic, interactive discussion. Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed for thank your you. time, for your answers, and if you can join me in thanking the Prime Minister.